In 1897, Queen Victoria celebrated the 60th anniversary of her accession to the British throne. The world was enjoying a period of peace and prosperity such as had seldom been experienced. Four years later, as the 20th century dawned, Queen Victoria died. Heads of state from all over the world attended her funeral. At this time, apart from France, all the major European states had monarchies, many of them related to the British crown. Queen Victoria was regarded as the matriarch of them all, and her death was widely seen as the end of an era. Few, though, could have foreseen how violent and unstable the world was about to become. In 1900, much of the focus for world affairs still lay with the major European nations. In the east was Russia, whose vast domain stretched from the Arctic in the north, the northern Pacific in the east, Manchuria, Mongolia, Afghanistan and Persia in the south, to the borders with Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Balkans in the west. At the head of this empire was the autocratic Tsar Nicholas II, whose power was safeguarded by a secret police, whose tentacles stretched far and wide, and a large army. The cities of Western Russia were as cosmopolitan as any in Europe, enjoying a rich abundance of the arts. The majority of Russians, however, still lived a primitive peasant life. Serfdom, which tied the peasants to the land as virtual slaves, had only been abolished some 20 years earlier, and the vast majority of Russians still had little say in political affairs. There was a large industry, but compared with Western Europe, it was backward. Neighboring Austria-Hungary was a shadow of its former self especially since its defeat by Prussia in 1866. Here another emperor, the elderly Franz Joseph, ruled an uneasy combination of Austrians, Hungarians and Poles and looked to dominate the polyglot races of the Balkans to the south. The splendors of his court in Vienna could not disguise growing national splits within the empire. His northern neighbor, Germany, was the young and growing giant of Europe, a collection of kingdoms and principalities under the domination of Prussia. It had only been united as one at the conclusion of Prussia's shattering defeat of France in 1870. It was ruled by the ambitious Kaiser Wilhelm II, a great nephew of Queen Victoria. Germany had a large and powerful army. This was supported by a rapidly expanding and efficient industry, especially in the Ruhr, in the west of the country. France was Europe's one major republic. The French were content to enjoy themselves at home, with Paris secure in its reputation as Europe's capital of fun, and to enlarge and consolidate their colonial possessions in Africa and Indochina. Yet in every Frenchman's heart burned a fierce desire to regain the eastern provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, which had been ceded to Germany after the disastrous war of 1870. Across the English Channel was Britain, still the envy of other nations. She was ruled by King Edward VII, the Sporting King. The source of her power was the British Empire, enlarged and consolidated under Queen Victoria 
It now covered one-sixth of the globe. The empire's greatest benefit was trade, with raw materials being brought back to Britain to feed its large industrial base and so flood the marketplaces of the world with goods. In order to guard its far-flung empire, Britain relied mainly on the Royal Navy, then the largest in the world. Outside of Europe, two emerging powers were waiting in the wings. The United States of America was just entering a boom time, which would see its gross national product almost triple between 1897 and 1914. This economic growth was accompanied by a rapid rise in immigration. Some nine million arrived during the first decade of the new century. Most of the immigrants had come from Europe in order to start a new life. Their determination to turn their backs on the past did much to influence the US foreign policy of isolationism. The vastness of the country, much of it still virgin territory, meant that the immigrants could be easily absorbed. America's isolationism did not stop her from beginning to create an empire. This was as a result of a war fought with Spain in 1898 over Cuba and the Philippines. These recreations of the fighting were made at the time by pioneer filmmaker Thomas Edison. In truth, the US Army quickly became bogged down in Cuba. Future President Teddy Roosevelt, seen here on the left, left his government post to command his Rough Riders in Cuba with great dash. The Spanish suffered heavy casualties, but the final outcome was decided in the Philippines by the US Navy, which sank the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay. Not only did the war gain Cuba its independence, but gave the United States the Philippines and Guam. The other power about to emerge on the world stage was Japan. In 1894, she had gone to war with China, which was still a medieval society in contrast to Japan, which during the past 40 years had increasingly embraced Western technology. The cause of this oriental conflict was Korea, which Japan wanted to annex. The decisive battle won by the Japanese was fought at sea and encouraged Japan to create a powerful modern navy and army. For Europe, colonial rivalry was centered on Africa. Britain had the largest slice, followed by France. Latecomer Germany had sizable colonies. Other imperial powers were Belgium, Portugal, Spain, and finally, Italy. By 1900, almost the entire continent had been divided up. Kaiser Wilhelm II was especially envious of Britain's hold on Africa. He was therefore delighted when war broke out in South Africa in 1899 between the Boers, who wanted to break away and set up their own republic, and the British. Helped by German-supplied rifles and field guns, the Boers initially inflicted a series of defeats on the British Army. They were a severe embarrassment to an army which considered itself almost invincible in colonial warfare. The highly mobile Boer commandos, although numerically inferior, 
proved to be more than a match for the stereotyped British tactics. British were forced to send tens of thousands of reinforcements, many from the Empire, to South Africa. They also had to adopt more mobile tactics, but though the Boers were forced onto the defensive, they refused to give in, and the war dragged on as the British hunted down one commando after another. Much of the harrying of the Boers was done by mounted columns. These learned to live off the country as the Boers did. Many of the column commanders would become the leading British generals of the Great War of 1914-18. Lessons were learned the hard way in South Africa and would later bring about far-reaching reforms of the British Army. Gradually, overwhelming numbers penned in the Boers. German moral support, which soured relations with Britain, was not enough to sustain them. In 1902, the Boers finally sued for peace. Germany, too, clashed with the French over Morocco in northwest Africa, which was widely considered to be in the French sphere of influence in Africa. In 1905, the Kaiser even went as far as to visit the Sultan of Morocco. Six years later, only skillful diplomacy averted an armed clash between Germany and France after the Sultan had asked French troops to help quell some of his mutinous tribesmen, a request highly resented by Berlin. War, however, did come to North Africa in 1911. Tripoli, the old name for Libya was an outpost of the now decaying Turkish Ottoman Empire and was coveted by Italy, who had a number of settlers there. The Italians invaded on the pretext of their bad treatment by the Turks. After early successes against the Turkish army, the Italians became embroiled in guerrilla warfare against the Arabs in the interior. Eventually, though, Tripoli became an Italian colony. One unique feature of this war was that it was the first in which air power was used. Across the other side of the world, colonial rivalry caused another war, this time between Russia and Japan. The bone of contention was again Korea. The Russians were colonizing Manchuria and also wanted to extend their influence into Korea, now Japanese. Failing to achieve a diplomatic solution, the Japanese resolved on force and landed troops in northern Korea in spring 1904. They forced the Yalu River and entered Manchuria, driving the Russians north towards Mukden and away from their naval base at Port Arthur, which was besieged. Eventually, in mid-October, a large Russian fleet set out from the Baltic on what was to be a 20,000-mile voyage to relieve Port Arthur. On the way, it had a clash with British trawlers in the North Sea, in the belief that they were Japanese torpedo boats. Port Arthur, however, fell in January 1905, and the fleet was ordered to break through to Vladivostok. Finally, in May 1905, after many further tribulations, the fleet arrived in the Tsushima Straits, which separate Korea from Japan. The Japanese fleet was waiting, and to the amazement of the world, blew the Russian fleet out of the water. 
of the 38 Russian warships, only three made it through to Vladivostok. Thereafter, American President Theodore Roosevelt brokered a peace at this conference at Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Russia was forced to evacuate Manchuria and hand over Port Arthur to the Japanese. This humiliating defeat came as the last straw to the discontented Russian people, who had already suffered when troops killed hundreds of peaceful demonstrators in St. Petersburg in January 1905 on what became known as Bloody Sunday. Unrest grew and included a mutiny of the crew of the battleship Potemkin of the Black Sea Fleet. It culminated in a general strike in October which forced the Tsar to concede to the demand for a national legislative assembly. The Duma, as it was called, was set up, but autocracy still remained. The revolution was, however, a warning that the Russian people could only be pushed so far. The Battle of the Tsushima Straits helped to nurture another seed of conflict. Looking at the British model, the Germans saw that to be a true world power, not just an empire, a powerful army and a large industrial base were needed. They realized that it was vital to have a strong navy to protect their overseas trade. Under the guidance of Admiral von Tirpitz, a massive shipbuilding program to rival that of Britain was got underway. At the time, battleships bristled with guns of varying size, but the Tsushima Straits showed that it was the largest which had the decisive effect. Consequently, a new breed of all big gun ships came into being, the Dreadnoughts, named after the first of their kind, HMS Dreadnought, which was launched by the British in early 1906. Overnight, this ship made all existing capital vessels obsolete and gave von Tirpitz the chance to catch up. The result was the dreadnought race between Britain and Germany. German efficiency soon cut the average build time from three to two years, which created a scare in Britain, resulting in an increasing number of dreadnoughts being laid down, each class with ever larger guns. This early arms race served to increase Anglo-German tension. Other nations, too, succumbed to the dreadnought fever, and by 1914, all of the world's significant navies possessed them. International tension was encouraged by the gradual creation of two armed camps in Europe. In 1879, Germany and Austria-Hungary had formed an alliance to be joined three years later by Italy. This was to counter possible aggression by Russia or France. These, as a result, formed a pact in 1894. Italy, however, muddied the waters by pledging in 1902 that she would never fight France in return for a free hand in Libya. Britain, traditionally suspicious of France and of Russia's designs on Afghanistan and northern India, stayed out of continental entanglements. But she did ally herself with Japan in 1902 to divert Russian attention. Germany's growing industrial might and threat to traditional British markets forced Britain to rethink. In May 1903, Edward VII visited Paris, and this paved the way for the Entente Cordiale, signed the following year. He also embarked on other diplomatic missions, including one to Italy. In 1907 came the Anglo-Russian Entente. The rival pieces were now laid out on the chessboard. It was, however, in the Balkans that the real trouble lay. 
For centuries, most of the eastern Mediterranean region had been part of the Ottoman Empire, which was ruled by the Turkish Sultan. Slowly, during the 19th century, the Turkish grip on this area had been loosened. This was largely because of a weakening of the Turkish will. Indeed, by the 1870s, Turkey had become known as the sick man of Europe. In the Balkans themselves, states led by Greece had begun to achieve independence. By 1900, Turkish territory in the Balkans was much reduced, and there were now five independent states, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, and Montenegro. The provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, although nominally still Turkish, were garrisoned by Austrian troops. In 1908, there was a coup d'etat in Turkey, and a group of reforming army officers, the Young Turks, came to power. Austria, fearful of a revived Turkey and backed by Germany, promptly annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. Serbia, supported by Russia, objected because of the Serbian minority there, but to no avail. She therefore helped to form the Balkan League of neighboring states. Taking advantage of Turkey's problem with Italy, they attacked her in October 1912. The Turks mobilized more troops but in the face of the Balkan League's determination, they soon began to lose ground. As with other wars at this time, many nations sent military observers to try and glean lessons which could be applied to their own concepts of warfare. This war was also the first to attract large numbers of film cameramen. By May 1913, the Turks had been driven out of Europe, apart from toeholds in the Dardanelles and around Constantinople. The major powers, none of whom had supported the war, now stepped in to draw up a peace settlement. This awarded former Turkish territory to Greece, Bulgaria and Serbia, and created the new state of Albania. But in June, Bulgaria, who had gained least territory and wanted more, attacked Greek and Serbian troops in Macedonia. Romania now attacked Bulgaria, and the Turks also joined in. Forced to fight a multi-front war, Bulgaria soon caved in. The other states, including Turkey, gained at her expense in this second Balkan war. Serbia's successes in the Balkans fostered both her own self-confidence and a nationalism among the Slavs of Bosnia-Herzegovina strong enough to plunge the whole of Europe into war. On the 28th of June, 1914, in Bosnia's provincial capital of Sarajevo, a bomb was thrown at a passing car. It missed the occupants, who were no less than the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Unruffled, they continued their official visit. A few hours later, a Bosnian farmer's son Gavrilo Princip rushed up to the royal car, fired a pistol, and fatally wounded the Austrian couple. Princip was immediately arrested. The bodies of the Archduke and his wife were brought back for a state funeral in Vienna. Austrian anger at the outrage centered on Serbia in the belief that Princip was a member of a secret Serbian nationalist group the Black Hand. Therefore, on the 23rd of July, after consulting with Germany, the Austrians delivered an ultimatum to Serbia. The Serbs proposed that the matter go to arbitration. At the same time, though, they began to mobilize their forces. This prompted Vienna to declare war on Serbia on the 28th of July doing so for the first time in history by telegram. It also began to assemble its forces. The Austrian troop trains now began to roll. Little did these cheerful soldiers realize that like their trains, Europe had been set off down a route 
that had but one destination, all-out war. At the end of July 1914, less than five weeks after the murder of the heir to their throne, Austro-Hungarian troops began to move into Serbia. In the meantime, there had been frantic diplomatic activity elsewhere in Europe. Berlin warned St. Petersburg that any form of Russian mobilization in support of Serbia would be countered by German mobilization and war. In spite of pleas by her French ally, Russia began a partial mobilization. Austrian guns began to bombard the Serbian capital, Belgrade, on the 30th of July, 1914. It was this which provoked the Russian government to order full mobilization, regardless of the earlier German warning. The assurance that a massive army of fellow Slavs was now available to support them encouraged Serbian resistance to the Austrian attack. The Kaiser and his government, though, had meant what they said, being too closely bound to their Austrian ally not to support her. They therefore immediately declared war on Russia and also mobilized their forces. Positioned as she was in the center of Europe, Germany's greatest fear was simultaneous war on two fronts, east and west. Her military planners had therefore devoted much attention to ensuring that the mobilization machine was well oiled and efficient in order to be able to deploy their armies before their potential enemies could do so. Thus in 1914, the scheme worked like clockwork and within 48 hours, the German armies were marching to war amid the cheers and almost hysterical enthusiasm of the German people. In the hope of avoiding an immediate conflict in the West, the German government asked the French ambassador to Berlin whether France proposed to stay neutral. The reply was that France would consult her interests. On the 1st of August, the French, conscious of their alliance with Russia and threatened by the German mobilization, also began to prepare for war. That was sufficient for the German government. The troop trains rolled westwards as well as eastwards, and war was declared against France on the 3rd of August. The final piece of the jigsaw was Britain. Because her entente with France and Russia did not commit her to going to their aid in time of war, she initially took a neutral stance. Her people were thus able to enjoy a perfect summer's public holiday on Monday the 3rd of August. The next day, German troops entered neutral Belgium. Realizing that an all-dominant Germany on the continent would not be in Britain's interests, the British government invoked an 1839 treaty on Belgian neutrality. An ultimatum was sent to Germany to withdraw. It was rejected, and that night Britain found herself also at war. As in other countries, the British people greeted the war with almost frenetic joy. So, in the space of a few short weeks, Europe had become enmeshed in a conflict which was to be much more awesome than any of the participants could have possibly imagined. As the nations deployed their forces, each did so according to a carefully prepared plan for defeating the enemy. The Germans owed theirs to Count Alfred von Schlieffen, chief of the great general staff for 14 years from 1891. Recognizing the dangers of having to fight Russia and France at the same time, and that France would mobilize very much more quickly than her ally, he decided to knock her out and then deal with Russia. Assuming that the first French move would be to regain Alsace-Lorraine, 
he envisaged a huge turning movement through the Low Countries and then swinging west of Paris in order to seize the French capital and attack the bulk of the French armies from behind. Helmut von Moltke, von Schlieffen's successor, was not wholly happy about the plan and gradually amended it to make the door swing just through Belgium. He also strengthened the forces in Alsace-Lorraine at the expense of the right wing of the wheel. The German army itself was a highly efficient instrument, well trained and with a very effective general staff. The smooth deployment to the frontiers was an indication of its meticulous preparation. Weaponry and equipment were also good. In particular, the German army was much better equipped with heavy artillery than any other. Pre-war theorists had identified the French army's greatest strength as a moral one, its élan or dash, which made it more effective in attack than in defence. Hence the French planned to take to the offensive at the outset, and as von Schlieffen rightly surmised, against Alsace-Lorraine. The French army had learned from its shortcomings of 1870, and although the red trousers of its infantry and breastplates of the cavalry seemed to belong to a bygone age, it too was efficient. It could also call upon combat-hardened colonial troops from North Africa. The French army's outstanding weapon, without doubt, was the quick-firing Soixante Quinze, the best field piece of its time. Unlike the Continental Armies, the British Army was all volunteer. It was therefore smaller, and much of it was committed to defense of empire. The Army had learnt much from the Boer War, and was thoroughly professional, especially its infantry, who were trained to fire 15 aimed shots a minute. It had also finally adopted the continental European practice of employing a proper general staff. Another improvement as a result of its South African war experience was to the British Army's supply system. It had been agreed with the French that a small force would immediately be sent to France. The French, though, considered Britain's navy was her most important contribution to the joint war effort. Fortuitously, on the 10th of July, the fleet had been gathered for a review by the King, now George V. This had included calling up reservists, who were not afterwards discharged because of the worsening international situation. It could thus quickly deploy to its war stations. One weakness of Britain's army was that it had only limited trained reserves, which were used to bring its existing units up to strength. There was, though, the territorial force of part-time soldiers. Available, too, were Empire troops, but these would take time to deploy. Lord Kitchener, hero of Imperial Wars, was appointed Minister of War. He distrusted the territorials and decided to recruit an all-volunteer force from civilians and train it on regular army lines. Such was the patriotism that gripped the nation that numbers were no problem. It would, however, be some months before this new force could be trained and equipped for war. Meanwhile, the great German advance continued into Belgium. The small Belgian army resisted bravely, but could not stem the German tide. Soon the German armies were closing on the great forts of Liège, key to the Belgian defences. It was now that the German heavy artillery came into its own. The forts were bombarded into submission. 
On the 14th of August, the Germans entered the Belgian capital, Brussels, and pushed onwards. Some Belgian towns, which had offered resistance, were badly damaged by the Germans. Others, including Brussels, were virtually unscathed. The Belgians now withdrew towards Antwerp as the German wheel began to swing south. Some German forces followed up the Belgians, but they conducted an effective rearguard action to keep their army intact. The German wheel created a large number of refugees as people fled their homes fearful of what might happen to them if they remained. French troops crossed into Lorraine on the same day that Brussels fell and pushed back the German outposts. Thus began the Battle of the Frontiers, which was marked by French attack and German counter-attack. In the end, it was German heavy artillery and machine guns which told, and the French fell back having suffered 300,000 casualties in two weeks of fighting. For these French troops, Elan had not been enough to overcome the firepower delivered by modern weapons. To the northwest, the great German wheel was approaching the French frontier. One French army and the small British expeditionary force faced the bulk of the German forces. At Mons, on the 23rd of August, the Germans experienced the firepower of the British infantry for the first time, suffering heavy losses and believing that the British had many more machine guns than just two per battalion. The German pressure did not slacken though, and their threat to outflank the British and French forced the latter to withdraw. They now pursued the Allied forces southwards for the next two weeks. Both sides suffered from the hot August sun. The British turned once at Le Cateau to face the Germans, largely because they were too exhausted to march further, but it did not mean that they were too tired to fight. Then the retreat continued, but all was not well with the Schlieffen plan. Troops had to be detached to besiege Namur and Antwerp. Congestion made resupply difficult, and the troops were becoming exhausted by the endless days of marching. Worse, the wheel began to contract and swing east, instead of west of Paris, as it pursued the Franco-British forces, with the westernmost German army nudging ever closer to its neighbor. The French, in the meantime, had hastily gathered another army in the Paris area under the command of General Gallieni the governor of Paris. This army began to deploy east of Paris as the Germans crossed the River Marne. A large fleet of Paris cabs helping to move it to the front. Gallieni's army struck the westernmost German army in the flank. Caught off balance, this army pulled back northwards. The other German armies were quickly affected and the withdrawal became general. The French and British troops got their tired limbs into action once more and followed up. 
the miracle of the Marne had left the Schlieffen plan in tatters. Both sides were now almost exhausted, and when the Germans reached the Aisne, the next major river line to the north, they dug in. Half-hearted Allied attempts to shift them failed, and by mid-September both sides had taken what was to be a brief breathing space. Across the other side of Europe, a similar massive opening clash had occurred. The relatively small German forces in East Prussia had been ordered to remain on the defensive until they received reinforcements from the West. Germany's ally, Austro-Hungary, had different ideas. For a start, she was already embroiled in attacking Serbia. The Austrian chief of staff, the thrusting Konrad von Herzendorf, was also looking north to the vulnerable salient created by Russian Poland. In the belief that the Germans would attack it from the north, he planned a thrust from the south to catch the Russians before they were fully ready. The Austrian army was, however, an imperfect instrument. While it had some good equipment, especially heavy artillery, it suffered from being made up of men from no less than ten different races, each often speaking a different language. The Russians, too, had an offensive strategy based on the Polish salient. One army would strike north from it and another from the west to cut off and destroy the German forces in East Prussia. A further force was to strike south into Austria and Galicia to trap the Austrian forces there north of the Carpathian Mountains. The Russian army was the largest in Europe, capable of mobilizing six million men, but it was also very cumbersome. While a few motor cars might give a veneer of a modern army, much of the Russian weaponry was out of date compared with that of its opponents. An inadequate railway system also meant that mobilization and deployment would be slow. Corruption and incompetence were rife among senior officers, and few lessons of the Russo-Japanese war had been taken to heart. The rank and file were largely illiterate peasantry, but what they did have was courage and endurance qualities which were about to be tested to the full. The Austrian attack on Serbia did not go as planned. One problem was that many of their soldiers initially on this front came from Bosnia and they feared to use them against the Serbians. After the two recent Balkan wars, the Serbs were battle-hardened, unlike their opponents. The Serbians enjoyed another advantage, in that the terrain favoured defence. Frequently, the Austrians found themselves attacking uphill, and were often thrown off balance by sudden Serbian counter-attacks. Two Austrian offensives were repulsed with heavy casualties. Superior Austrian artillery was not enough to tip the balance. After six weeks, they had been driven back to their start line. Things went little better in Galicia. The Russian and Austrian armies, both bent on attack, literally blundered into one another. Both sides suffered a mauling, but the Austrians came off slightly worse and were forced to withdraw some hundred miles westwards. In East Prussia, events were more dramatic. The first Russian army crossed the border at dawn on the 17th of August. Three days later, having driven in the German outposts, 
the Russians attacked the main body of the German 8th Army at Gumbinnen and forced it to fall back. The Russian 2nd Army, thinking that the 1st Army was now exploiting a decisive victory, began to attack East Prussia from the south. Unfortunately, the 1st Army had made no attempt to follow up after the Battle of Gumbinnen. At this point, the German commander was replaced by Paul von Hindenburg, seen on the left, and Chief of Staff Erich von Ludendorff, a combination which was to prove formidable. They arrived on the 23rd of August and found that plans had already been drawn up to strike the slowly advancing Russian 2nd Army. Three days later, the Germans attacked. Their task was initially made easier by the Russian practice of transmitting uncoded messages on their few primitive radios, which were used by the higher command. Consequently, the Germans had an accurate picture of the Russian deployment and intentions. The main attack was against the exposed Russian western flank. Soon the Germans were behind the main body of the Russian army. The Russian Second Army began to disintegrate as its command and control systems were thrown into increasing confusion. Finally, at the end of four days fighting, the Second Army had effectively ceased to exist as the Germans rounded up thousands of prisoners. Von Hindenburg chose the name of Tannenberg for his victory after a village of that name in the area, site of a defeat of the Teutonic Knights 500 years earlier. He saw his success as a fitting revenge. Throughout this time, the Russian First Army had remained largely where it was. Von Hindenburg was determined to strike it before it became fully aware of the disaster at Tannenberg. His men, therefore, had little or no time to enjoy the fruits of victory and were quickly on the march northeastwards. The Russians were close to the wooded Masurian lakes and it was into this difficult boggy terrain that the Germans intended to drive them. On the 7th of September, the Germans attacked. This time, though, a large part of the Russian army managed to get away, although not without suffering heavy casualties and losing much equipment. The Russians withdrew back across the river Niemen, leaving a swathe of destruction behind them. The Germans were content to halt on the border. Outside Europe, other clashes with the Germans had broken out. Japan, seeing the opportunity to enlarge her growing overseas possessions, attacked Germany's foothold in China, Tsingtao, with help from her British ally. It fell in November 1914, as did the German Pacific Islands. In southern Africa, a campaign was launched by South African troops to seize German Southwest Africa. Hardline Afrikaners in South Africa, still resentful of the British, had attempted a revolt to prevent their country from fighting on the British side. This was quickly crushed, and the thrust rapidly gained momentum. These campaigns, and more which were about to open, began to give the war its global aspect. The decisive fronts, however, remained in Europe. Here, as in any conflict fought amid populated areas, Civilians, as well as fighting men, were beginning to suffer. In both East and West, 
the initial war plans had largely failed. And it was becoming clear that the widespread belief that the war would be over by Christmas, one way or the other, was very optimistic. The question that each side was now asking was what to do next.